And so before we start our Sunday service, let's just start off with some worship.
pass this time to Pastor Ron. You made us in your image and sent your son Jesus so that we could actually live as people who are made in your image. The Lord bless us this morning. Help us to uh, remember all the right things, Lord, about your goodness, about the direction that you have for us. We especially want to remember your missionaries' prayer for Albert and, and Elaine in Taiwan as they continue their work there, reaching out to children, reaching out with the gospel, good news, that you have a rest that you are inviting everyone to enter. Thank you for all this, Lord. Pray to bless our service this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. you may be seated. Okay, so it is good to, to be here with you. And what we are going to do now is we're going to take some time and uh, do some meditation. And... Um, uh, Anthony, I hope uh, that you have a little bit of uh, meditation on cue. Uh, <coughs> if not, no big deal. Silence is okay. I think we got to not be afraid of silence. It's so uh, uh, difficult sometimes, I think, for us to, uh, to be silent and not have things going on. If you ever listen to a radio station, it's a constant stream of noise. And whenever there's no noise, everyone goes, What's wrong? Something bad happened? So, uh, don't worry. Silence is good. It gives you an opportunity to think, listen. And so, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read Psalms chapter 119. So, if you want to open your Bible to Psalm chapter 119, and what we're going to do is we're going to meditate on this passage together. And again, when you read Psalms, try and think of the stuff that's been talked about up, uh, throughout the Old Testament. Right? Prophecies, uh, the deliverance of the Israelites from Egypt, the creation story especially, uh, the giving of the law. But we've been talking a lot about that in the book of Leviticus. We're looking at Psalm 119 this morning. We're going to start in verse 9. You'll see that Psalm 119 is um, split up into, it's an acrostic poem. So every uh, first letter of every section is started off by a, a um, Hebrew letter of the alphabet. So there's, I believe there's 24 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Maybe I'm thinking Greek. But uh, each letter, or each section of this poem starts with that letter. So they call it acrostic. Psalm 19, verse, Psalm 119, verse 9. Here we go. How can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word, I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart, that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lips, I recount all the laws that have come from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes, as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts. And consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. Let's take a moment to, uh, to think through that. So feel free to keep looking at your Bible. You can read through it once more again if you like. And uh, try to let it um, in your heart. We're going to do that now.
Amen. And God bless His Word as we look at it this morning. We are going to move to a time of preaching. And preaching is important. It's important to proclaim. That's what preaching means. It just means to proclaim something. Proclaim something is true. And it's important. It's important because uh, we need to be made disciples. So we come and we proclaim the Bible. And the more we we uh, proclaim it, and take it in, the more we become like Jesus, the more we know uh, God. Uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, the Bible says. So uh, we need to know God's, God's word. God's word isn't God, it's God's word. We need to know it so that we can know God. We can have a relationship with him. So um, we've been looking at the book of Leviticus, and uh, this morning what we're going to do is we're going to finish up our series in the book of Leviticus. And I know my wife at home is saying, praise the Lord. (laughs) Uh, The book of Leviticus has been a bit of a long haul. But you know what? I think that there's been some really good things uh, that we've pulled out of this. So I want to do a little bit of a recap and of each of the messages. And uh, uh, I want you to try and remember what what these parts were about. So Leviticus chapter 1, verses 1 to 5, and chapter 16. We looked at this whole idea of a sacrificial system. You'll, if you remember, the book of Leviticus starts right at the end of book, uh, the book of Exodus. So God uh, gives the Israelites the instructions for the tabernacle. The tabernacle is built in the camp around the nation of Israel in the desert, or the nation of Israel is around the tent in the desert, and uh, then God's glory comes down onto the tent, and God speaks to Moses from the glory. And he says these things to him, so that the Israelites know how to approach God, know how to live with God in their camp. So the first part is this sacrificial system. And the whole reason why they do the sacrificial system is uh, so that atonement can be made for the Israelites. That is uh, uh, an idea of of, uh, reconciliation, atonement, to be made at one with God, because we're separated from God as human beings. And so uh, sacrifices of blood, uh, and the Day of Atonement was put together. Uh, we jumped around to, to, verse, to chapter 16 because that is the, the Day of Atonement, this idea, or this uh, festival that's, uh, remember we talked about that last week, it's, it happens in the fall, and it is a day where they take the goat, two goats, and one goat they sacrifice, and the other goat they confess all the sins of the people on, and it, it goes off into the wilderness. It's the scapegoat. And so you got the sacrifice of atonement and then the scapegoat. And so uh, there we are, this whole concept of atonement. And Jesus is our sacrifice of atonement today. This is what he did when he died on the cross for our sins. In the New Testament, they write about this idea that Jesus is our sacrifice of atonement. He's the one that makes us one with God. He's the one that gives us reconciliation with God. So we look at that to begin with, atonement. The second thing we look at is um, the uh, way that we approach God, that it really has to be done only in certain ways, that the Israelites were taught this uh, through the death of Nadab and Abihu. Nadab and Abihu were the sons of Aaron. They, uh, once the temple or the uh, tabernacle was put together and the glory came on the tabernacle, Nadab and Abihu, maybe they got caught up with it in, in it or something like this. Maybe they had some pride in their heart and they thought it would be a good idea to take incense and to go into the presence of God. And when they did that, they dropped dead because Moses had given a certain way for the Israelites to approach God. And it was very important for them to follow that way, to uh, not go with their own pride, to not go with their own understanding, but to go with God. God is the one who makes them holy. They don't make themselves holy by making up rules and stuff like this. So uh, they can only approach God in that way. And today it's the same with us. We only approach God through Christ. Uh, we, can't, we can't make up our own ideas of how to approach God and, and uh, make up our own ideas of right and wrong. We've we got to do it God's way. He is the creator. He is the one that makes us holy. And so we've got to do it through Christ. Uh, the next thing we looked at was Leviticus 11 through 15, purity rules and food laws. So kosher laws and whatnot, the different types of foods that the Israelites were allowed to eat. Also, the different types of things that they had to do to make themselves clean. If they were to touch something dead or something unclean, uh, then they would have to like wash themselves. And they, they were ceremonially unclean. They couldn't approach God until evening. And uh, so there was ways to get clean, 
And some things that made them unclean was getting sick, right? And sometimes getting sick is not your fault. It's nothing that you did. It's just you got a broken body and, and you get sick, right? But uh, after someone was healed, there was supposed to be a... After someone got better, there was supposed to be a sacrifice that was offered, a recognition that God is the healer. God is not just the one that makes us holy. God is the one that heals us. So there's a recognition there that, Jesus, that God is the one that makes the Israelites clean, right? They're supposed to remember that, and we're supposed to remember that as well, that Jesus is the one that makes us clean. We're not holy on our own. We're not healed on our own. We should give thanks for our healing as much as we give thanks for our food. Every time you get sick and get better, thank God. Thank the Lord. He's provided for your healing. Uh, and pray to him if you're sick so that he might heal you and give you a miraculous healing. That is a taste of the kingdom of God coming, uh, coming to earth from heaven. That's what miraculous healings are about. So today we find our healing and our cleanness again in Jesus. You see how this is all pointing to him, right? You see how this is all pointing to Christ, that he is uh, our ultimate sacrifice, that he is our ultimate healer, that God wanted to make us clean. He wanted to make the Israelites clean, so he gave them all this, thing, all this stuff to do, but it was pointing to Jesus, because none of this stuff could really make the Israelites clean. None of this stuff could really bring them into the presence of God and make it all right for them to walk into the presence of God. God had to fix that himself, and he did it on the cross. That was the plan. Leviticus 17 was talking about idolatry. So we got atonement, we got um, approaching God and only in a certain way, uh, we've got purity that comes through Jesus, and then we've got a word against idolatry. The Israelites were continuing to practice idolatry in the fields, and uh, they were commanded to, to stop doing that. They were supposed to make the right sort of sacrifices, and only sacrifice to God alone. And uh, again, we are uh, the same in Christ, and participate in his body and blood alone for salvation. We can't go out and sacrifice to the goat idols in the fields and come at the communion table of God and think that we're in the the right place with him. It's God alone. He's very um, exclusive, I want to say. But truth, by nature, is exclusive. Two plus two only equals four. It doesn't equal seven, right? So there we go, a word against idolatry. And then uh, sexual ethics and social justice, Leviticus 18 to 20. This is a big deal. This is a big deal in our culture today. I mean, how much does our culture today talk about sex? Like a lot. Right? It's a big deal for human beings. We've got to get this right also. We've got to be uh, pure in this way also because it harms people big time when it's practiced outside of God's ways. So uh, sexual relations and social justice rules, God commanded these things so that the Israelites would be holy, set apart for his purposes. Jesus is what makes us holy. He has purchased for us a holy life. Leviticus 18 to 20 gives us some idea of how to be set apart for God's purpose, but it's only some idea because these things were given to the Israelites, uh, not necessarily to Christians. So what, what passes over from the Israelites to the Christian uh, today? The New Testament letters taught the church how to put this stuff into practice now, now that God's kingdom lives in us. It's not a, an earthly kingdom anymore that's got borders. The kingdom of God lives in us. When we accept the rule of Christ, the kingship of Christ, he is, uh, he is our king. So then how we put this stuff into practice, the New Testament letters teach us how to do that. So we've got to read those and see how they quoted the Old Testament, see how they put it into practice in the cultures of the different peoples and the different cities that they were in. Great. Okay, Leviticus 21 and 22, stepping into the meeting place with God. The priests had to be holy and without defect. Remember this whole uh, commands that the priests had to, to only live in a certain way, only marry certain women. And uh, they, uh, the food had to be treated with utmost respect and eaten by only certain people and whatnot. Uh, all this stuff had to be uh, put in effect properly. Um, everything had to be made right with sacrifices and cleansing to go into the meeting place. And again, we looked back at how Jesus is our ultimate sacrifice that makes us holy so that we can be in the meeting place with God. Uh, Leviticus 23 to 25, we, last week, I really liked this. We looked at celebrating God's rest. 
I, I really liked that idea. I mean, as Christians, we look forward to God's rest. When Jesus comes back again and, and uh, separates everything unrighteous from the righteous so that we, we get to live with God in, in uh, righteous perfection, isn't that awesome? I mean, I don't want to even call it righteous perfection because that would be like self-righteous or something like that. Or maybe it would, it would cheapen it a little bit. I just want to say perfection, that God will come and make everything right and he will save people who want to be with him from evil. And so there will be no practice of corruption and injustice and bribery anymore. God will come in and uh, we will follow him and his ways are all right and perfect. And the utopia will be here with Christ as our king. That is the rest that we're to look forward to, that we look back on when God created the six days, uh, the, the seventh day of creation, right? So it was a picture of what he was going to do for us. I mean, it was also the thing that he did for real. Don't, uh, don't get me wrong. I'm not uh, mythologizing the uh, seven days of creation. I think that stuff is true. It happened. Uh, the Bible is true. That stuff happened. But God has greater purposes for things happening, right? Uh, the Exodus happened. Passover happened, but God had a greater truth for that in Christ. Uh, the uh, parting of the Red Sea happened. Uh, the flood happened. But it was pointing to something uh, greater. That Jesus is able to save us. That God wants to save us. So now we're coming to... Uh, so when we celebrate on Sunday morning, I think this is part of celebrating God's rest. When you take a day off of work, that's part of celebrating God's rest. Right? I think those are things that we can still put into practice today. Uh, so, you know, don't work seven days in a row. You know, always take a day off uh, to remember God's rest. So, um, uh, let's see. Now we are looking at Leviticus 26 and 27. This is the end of the book. The end of the book. And I want to ask you a question as we look at the end of the book. You ever made a vow? made a vow? You ever promised God something? A vow to the Lord and spe specifically. I mean, I made wedding vows, uh, promises to Kathy that, uh, that I would be with her uh, as long as we both shall live, right? That uh, our romance was our romance and that was from God and that we, that's what we recognized there and that's what we became serious about and putting a ring on each other's finger and, and uh, it's, it was good. Marriage is a picture of that. Marriage is a picture of uh, of Christ in his church as well. That the church should be serious in, in connecting with, with Christ. And that Christ is serious in connecting with his church. We are together and, and uh, all parties need to be serious in this. So have you ever made a vow to the Lord? Have you ever been in trouble? Like serious trouble? Have you ever heard, like seen this on TV? Oh, oh God, I'm in so much trouble. If you get me out of this, I will never watch another episode of SpongeBob again. <laughs> or I will never do this evil thing. Or I'll, I'll never tell a lie again. Or I'll never, and usually the character on TV, after they get out of the mess, they're like, I was just kidding, God. You know that, right? So <laughs> it wasn't really serious. Isn't that horrible, though, to vow something to the Lord and not be serious about it? To vow your life to the Lord and not be serious about it. I mean, we got to take this stuff seriously, don't we? If we call ourselves by the name of Jesus, if we call ourselves Christian, we've got to take this stuff seriously. All this stuff. I think that's what Moses was trying to say to the Israelites in chapter 26 and 27. Take this stuff seriously. There's blessings for following the way. And there's punishments for rejecting God. There's punishments for rejecting God. Punishment for disobedience. And then we have this, this kind of strange part at the end, uh, chapter 27, about dedicating things to the Lord, making vows to the Lord, and then there's a cost to redeeming it if we don't fulfill those vows, if, uh, if we don't want to fulfill our promises, or if we can't for some reason. It was a cost for the Israelites to redeem uh, those things. So let's take a look at this passage a little bit more closely. Uh, chapter 26 of Leviticus. So go ahead and open your Bible to that. And you can follow along and we will take a look at it. This stuff is important. It's good. 
Do not make idols or set up an image or a sacred stone for yourselves, and do not place a carved stone in your land to bow down before it. I am the Lord your God. Observe my Sabbaths and have reverence for my sanctuary. I am the Lord your God. If you follow my decrees and are careful to obey my commands, I've got this in bold in my Bible. I like, you know, well, I mean, in my notes anyway. I've got this bold here. If you follow my decrees and are careful to obey my commands, remember this is at the end of Leviticus. This is at the end of this big body of, of commands that God has given to the Israelites in order for the, them to get close to him. If you follow my decrees and are careful to obey my commands, I will send you rain in its season, and the ground will yield its crops, and the trees their fruit. Your threshing floor, or your threshing will continue until grape harvest, and the grape harvest will continue until planting, and you will eat all the food you want, and live in safety in your land. I will grant peace in the land, and you will lie down, and no one will make you afraid. I will remove the wild beasts from the land, and the sword will not pass through your country. I will pursue your enemies, and they will fall by the sword before you. Five of you will chase a hundred, and a hundred of you will chase ten thousand, and your enemies will fall by the sword before you. I will look on you with favor, and make you fruitful, and increase your numbers, and I will keep my covenant with you. You will be eating last year's harvest when you will have to move it out to make room for the new. I will put my dwelling place among you, and I will not abhor you. I will walk among you, and be your God, and you will be my people. I am the Lord your God, who brought you up out of Egypt, so that you would no longer be slaves to the Egyptians. I broke the bars of your yoke, and enabled you to walk with heads held high. Okay, well, the first thing I want to point out to you about this is that uh, blessings, this is obvious blessing. I hope that you were listening to this, right? What sorts of things did God say that he was going to do if they followed his instructions, Right? Uh, if they were careful, rain in the season, lots of harvest, abundance, and safety, and peace in the land, uh, fruitfulness, that he would dwell among them as well. They would be known by his name in other, other countries, right? If they were to follow his commands. Wouldn't that be cool? Wouldn't that be super cool? Right now, there's like, our neighbors to the south are having trouble right now. They've got riots in many of their cities. Uh, there's no riots in Canada right now, which is great. That's good. I'm really happy about that. Uh, but there's riots in the States right now. There's riots in the States because of past sins. You know, it's, it's a bit of a mess. And because of lack of reconciliation and lack of forgiveness, right? So if you're paying attention to that stuff at all, it's, if you turn on the news, it's horrible to see these things happening. There's huge division. So why am I uh, talking about this? Because... If people followed God, they were promised peace. They were promised abundance. And generally, that's what happens. When you have a whole country that follows God, there's going to be peace, right? If the majority of the country follows God, even if you got a few evil people, right? If the, the police forces are all uh, honest and the people are all honest, there's going to be very little crime. And the police force will put away the people who do want to do the crime. Right? But if you've got corruption in your country, then you can just pay a bribe to get away with things. Right? I'm going to steal from a whole bunch of poor people and then pay the bribe to the judge so that uh, I don't uh, go to jail. But what does that do? It makes it okay to do evil. No one's going to stop you. And so the wicked flourish. And in a country where the wicked flourish, there's trouble. But what's happening right now? I mean, there's, there's riots in the streets in some American cities. And the police are being told not to do anything about it in some cities. Some cities take care of it, and some cities have not. So there's problems there. I mean, there's, there's rioters, there's people who think it's okay to burn down everybody else's business. The mess. So what I want to point out here is that it's natural. When people don't follow the Lord's ways, what ways are they following? It's not like there's a neutral path. If you don't do right, you do wrong. The opposite of not killing people is killing people. <laughs> the opposite of not burning your neighbor's house down is burning your neighbor's house down. Right? There's not this kind of neutral road that people can be on. So, unfortunately, that's what happened. That's what's happened to some people. 
Not everyone in the States is like that. I'm just, I'm just using that as an example because it's trouble. When people don't follow the Lord, it's trouble for a nation. It's trouble for a community. When people do follow the Lord, it's safety for a community. It's natural. God has designed the universe to work this way. God is in it as well. It's not just that it's, yeah, it's just naturally what happens. No, God is in it as well. Because there are people on the outside of the Israelites wanting to attack them. That's still the case today in Israel. There are people on the outside who want to attack them, who want to wipe them off the face of the earth and push them into the Mediterranean Sea. So why has God allowed them to exist in, in the way that they, that, that they have? You know, his ways are higher than our ways. Uh, I trust him, though. Why has uh, nations in the world had so much peace and whatnot? I think it's because people have gone with the ways of God. So, it wasn't just a natural thing. It's also that God was protecting them. Protecting them from, would protect them from drought and famine. Protect them with peace. Make sure their enemies would not be able to come in and attack them. And we see later that what happened was that the Israelites did not follow through with the covenant. And God took away his protection, protecting hand. I'm reading through the book of Ezekiel right now, and uh, a big part of the book of Ezekiel is the glory departing from the, the temple. Remember how the glory came down in Leviticus? And God's meeting place was with the people. God was with the people. His presence was there with them. Now he took it away. He took it away completely. And the Babylonians came in, burned down every important building, deported everybody to another land. But if you will not listen to me and carry out all these commands, and if you reject my decrees and abhor my laws, this is verse 15, and to carry out all my commands and so violate my covenant, then I will do this to you. I will bring on you sudden terror, wasting disease, and fever that will destroy your sight and sap your strength. You will plant seed in vain because your enemies will eat it. I will set my face against you so that you will be defeated by your enemies. Those who hate you will rule over you, and you will flee, even though no one is pursuing you. And then you've got uh, a big chunk of other things that the Lord said that will happen. And if you go down to... Uh, now, I think this... this we're going to look at verse 40 next, but um, of chapter 26. But I think if, if you look at this, it doesn't just work on a national level. It doesn't just work on a group level. It also works on an individual level. You know, if you live your life abhorring God's ways and accepting the ways of the devil, I think you're going to harm yourself. Just You're going to live towards a life of harm. Uh, God's hand of protection won't be with you, but if you live a, a life in God's ways, then, then you will live a life of blessing. Sometimes, though, I mean, things happen, Right? Jesus said in this world, you will have trouble even if you are following God. This is kind of the general rule. But there's exceptions to the rule. That's why we have the book of Job. That's why we have the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk. <laughs> so uh, to question, hey, I'm following you. Why are bad things happening? So that's a question for another day. I'm talking about the general rule. So let's see. I love this redemptive part, though. In verse 40, but if they will confess their sins and the sins of their ancestors, their unfaithfulness and their hostility towards me, which made me hostile toward them, so that I sent them into the land of their enemies, then when their uncircumcised hearts are humbled and they pay for their sin, I will remember my covenant with Jacob and my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham, and I will remember the land. God is a merciful God. Even if we go and, and do what's wrong, if we turn back to him, he will heal us. He will heal us. Sometimes you got to pay for your sin anyway. I mean, I can imagine someone on death row uh, in, in a country where there's, de uh, where there's capital punishment. And maybe they murdered somebody and then they ended up in, in jail and, and they're waiting for their execution. And if they turn to God in the midst of their, uh, of their humiliation, if they are properly humbled in heart and they say, Lord, forgive me my sins, God will forgive them and enter into their life again. For sure, he's a merciful God, right? He'll forgive them and cleanse them of their unrighteousness. But 
some of the consequences of sin uh, have to take place. The execution might still happen. It might not. They might get out. God might totally grant them 100% healing and whatnot. Uh, but if you beat up your body for 50 years, doing drugs and pulling your teeth and whatever else, marking yourself, uh, you know, and you end up diabetic and have to lose limbs. I don't, I, like, I'm, wow, that's really heavy, right? So uh, if you abuse yourself, okay, just to say, if uh, someone has diabetes, it's not necessarily because they've abused themselves. I'm just saying, giving an example of, of bad things, right, that can happen from people abusing themselves. Uh, sometimes you have to suffer the, the consequences of it, but God might sometimes heal you as well. He's a merciful God. There is healing that comes from being with Jesus. All of our healing comes from being with Jesus. So I love this part. Bad things happen if you do bad things, but if you turn to God, he will heal you. That's awesome. So then let's look at this last part of the passage. Chapter 27. The Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, if anyone makes a special vow to dedicate a person to the Lord by giving the equivalent value, here's the values that you got to set. There you go. And if the vow is an animal, here's how you got to do it. The owner wishes to redeem the animal, a fifth must be added to its value. If anyone dedicates their house, and they want to redeem it, they must add a fifth to its value. If anyone dedicates to the Lord part of their family land, and they want to redeem it, they must add a fifth to its value. Or a field. No one, however, may dedicate the firstborn because they're already devoted to the Lord. And that anything that is totally uh, devoted to the Lord has to be devoted. can't be taken back tithe of everything from the land, whether grain or soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. This is verse 30. Whoever would redeem any of their tithe must add a fifth of the value to it. These are the commands the Lord gave Moses at Mount Sinai for the Israelites. The Lord, if you get me out of this mess, I won't watch any more SpongeBob SquarePants. But wait a second, now that I'm out of this mess, I really do want to watch SpongeBob SquarePants. And so this is what it would be like. It would be like giving up another show and then that's a fifth more valuable, right, to you. So actually, I still want to watch SpongeBob SquarePants, but that means I would have to dedicate Star Trek to the Lord. <laughs> and I don't want to do that. So this is an encouragement to, to do what you say. And why is this here? Why is this the last thing that Moses writes about? Right? Uh, you know, I, I, uh, years ago, something that I did uh, uh, when I was first a Christian, I, I, have, I have a drum set at home. Eh? It's a nice black drum set. I really like it. It's, it sounds really nice and everything. And uh, I was reading through this stuff, and, and I was like, you know what? Uh, there's something in human beings that wants to dedicate stuff to God, right? We, we feel like... We want to dedicate stuff to God. And sometimes it's for bad reasons. Sometimes we're like, I will dedicate this to you so that you will do this for me. Like we're think, we think we can buy God or bribe him somehow to do stuff for us, right? That's a wrong reason to dedicate something from the Lord to the Lord. But sometimes we dedicate things to the Lord for the right reason. Because we know that if we do so, it's best for them, right? So I dedicated all my children to the Lord. Because uh, I, I, I want him to be their God, not me. I want, I want them to, to follow him and in, in, in his ways because I know that's the best thing for them, right? So, uh, so I have this really nice drum set and uh, I had this really nice symbol and I figured it was worth about tenth, a tenth of the value of the drum set. And so uh, I donated the symbol, uh, the crash symbol to the church that we were going to at the time or that I was going to at the time. And, uh, and I sort of regretted it. Maybe it was, it was a bad reason that I had in my heart for, for donating it because it was like my best symbol. It sounded so good. You could hit it, and you know how like cymbals, when they crash, you probably don't know this, but cymbals crash, right? And they make that nice crash sound. 
But then, depending on the symbol, you hit the symbol and it makes a nice crash sound and underneath is a ring and a gong sound. Or, or above it, there's, there's like a, a telephone ring type noise that it makes. And so what separates a really good crash symbol from a really garbage crash symbol is if it's just smooth all the way through. And I had this really nice uh, crash symbol that was just smooth all the way through. And I gave it to the church and then I was like, you know, I'd really like to take that back. I take that back, you know? <laughs> and if I was an Israelite, the way to take the symbol back from giving it to the temple would be to offer another symbol that's uh, one-fifth more of the value or to trade it for the money and one-fifth more of the value, right? A 20% increase on the value. But at, by that point, I could just go buy myself a new symbol, <laughs> right? So I think, I think at this point, that's, that's what this really means. Really mean it. If you're going to offer something to the Lord, really mean it. I think that's why Moses put this here, right after this whole encouragement of doing the right thing. Follow the commands and everything will go good with you. If you don't follow the commands, you'll be punished. This is the encouragement, right? You are being encouraged to follow the Lord and to put this stuff into practice. So if you're going to dedicate yourself or anything to God, mean it. Be serious about it. You know, be serious about it and do it. That's my message to you this morning. I think, what, what are you really not being serious about with God? School? Belongs to the Lord. He gave it to you. Are you cheating on your tests? You know? Are you putting that before everything else? I can't serve you, Lord, because I'm, I'm, uh, I'm preparing to make a lot of money. Even though you're the one that provides me all the money and the strength to make the money, I can't serve you. It's kind of a weird thing. You know, I think we all should serve God, even if we're going to school. God will provide for you, right? Or work. I can't serve you, God. I'm, I'm spending too much time at work. Man, God is the one that gave you the work. He's the one that really writes your checks. You can serve God. I can't give to you, God, because I'm saving up for retirement. Man, you might not even get a retirement. None of us are guaranteed those 70, 80 years. Right? So, you can give. If you're going to follow God, be serious about it. I think Jesus says stuff like this, right? You know? He who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for uh, work in the kingdom of God. Be serious. Israelites, be serious. Christians, be serious about following Jesus, because it is truly good. And it's truly harmful if you don't. So, let's all stand. It's time to pray. <clears throat> Maybe this morning you are in need of some repentance. Maybe this morning you're in need of, of dedicating yourself to the Lord, because you're like, I'm not really being serious, and so maybe I'm not really following him. Maybe you need to dedicate yourself to the Lord. Maybe you're deciding to be serious. Take a moment now, and let's pray, and I'll close this off in a word of prayer. Now's your time to talk to the Lord. Lord God, we thank you so much that uh, you have called us to a, a serious sort of relationship with you. So help us, Lord, because our hearts are so often divided, and there's parts of us that don't want to follow properly, and there's parts of us that, that do. So Lord, I thank you that the spirit that you put in us is greater than the spirit that's in the world. It's greater than our own spirits. So help us to trust in you, Lord, to help us to put this stuff into practice, to be serious about you. I pray that you bless your people now as they go and, and do this sort of thing. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Just a few announcements before we close out. 
Sunday school is actually going to start today. Yay! So uh, if you uh, are here and, and you are um, uh, in need of a student uh, handbook, um, hopefully you've signed up. Uh, we only got a limited number of copies, uh, but we can get more. So if you want to be uh, in, uh, in the Sunday school hour, let me know and, and we'll get you more copies. Uh, but if you signed up, uh, I do have a few extras, so you can come and talk to me if, if you haven't signed up and you want to join. Uh, the Zoom link is on the Facebook page, uh, so you can go and, and uh, get on there. And um, after service today, I'll be in the parking lot, and you can get a student handbook from me uh, so that you can participate in Sunday school. And uh, Sunday school, of course, is starting at 11 o'clock, so you've got time to get home and, and, uh, and get ready and whatnot. And um, yeah. So I think that's all for Sunday school. Um, our voting for nominations for the Elder Nominating Committee is today. Uh, or our voting for the Elder Nominating Committee is today. So uh, it's still on Facebook, on the WCC English Facebook page. So all you got to do is scroll down. It's, I think it's the third post. And you can uh, click on it. Now, if we don't get 54 votes, that's quorum. If we don't get 54 votes, we'll have to do it again in a couple weeks. So um, <clears throat> last count, we were at 38. And so including my family, it'll be like 40. So if you are over 16, uh, definitely make sure that you uh, vote. So you want to go on the, the Facebook page, uh, click on there, uh, check off two, two of the names of people you think would be trustworthy to pick elders for our church and uh, send it through the email address back to, um, back to uh, the church. So today is the voting day. It has to be done today. Tomorrow won't count. Uh, so, uh, so do it today so we can hit 54 and uh, we can get all that going. Uh, the church is still functioning. The ship is still sailing. So we are going to start a new uh, message series next week. And... Uh, what we're going to do is, is kind of follow that theme. Uh, if we're all in a ship, Jesus is our captain, I'm part of the command crew, and so are the elders, and, uh, and your counselors and whatnot. <clears throat> but you know what? We were in our English planning meeting and English elder meeting on Friday, and it just became clear to me that uh, we don't know if we're ready to set sail. And so we need to check it out. We need to batten down the hatches. We need to because uh, we got storms that are, uh, we're just in a storm, so we need to open the hatches and unfurl the sails and check on the crew and make sure that we're doing the right thing and everyone's trained to, uh, to do their job. So we're going to take a, 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 a sermon series set and uh, talk about how to do that. So I'm looking forward to that. It'll start next week. And of course, communion is next week as well. So uh, be prepared for that if you're at home. And if you're here, don't worry, we've got communion little cups so that you can uh, join us with that. And of course, if you're uh, going to come, make sure you register with Sarah before Saturday. Um, okay, great. Let's close with the word of prayer and our benediction. Lord, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for your kindness towards us and your awesomeness, God. We praise you because you are so good and because you're powerful, because your rest is coming, because your rest is here in Christ because your healing is here in Christ. And so we're, we're looking forward to all this, Lord, and I pray that you bless your people as they go and as they participate in Sunday school and, and, and in preparing the ship for sail. We thank you for all this. In Jesus' name, and now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, we honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. God bless you as you go. Uh, see you to everyone who's streaming. Everyone who's here, uh, we got to follow a certain rule to, uh, to get out so that we're, we're maintaining some social distance. So we're going to go row by row. Uh, so head out the, the back door there and uh, grab a squirt of sanitizer if you like. And, and we'll see you in the parking lot where you can visit for a bit. So, uh, so first row can go. Go ahead. And, and then second row can go after the first. And